especially to this day of Lahiri Mahashaya month <laughs> where we celebrated his Maha Samadhi earlier in the week and yesterday we had his birthday retreat but today is also still his Maha Samadhi and birthday when we can still tune in to him. Today rather than reading from Swamiji's usual um, rays of the one light we're going to read from the autobiography of a yogi. The, the master never counseled slavish belief. Words are only shells, he said. Win conviction of God's presence through your own joyous contact in meditation. No matter what the disciples' problem, the guru advised Kriya Yoga for, the, for its solution. The yogic key will not lose its efficiency when I am no longer present in the body to guide you, he said. This technique cannot be bound filed and forgotten in the manner of theoretical inspirations. Continue ceaselessly on your path to liberation through Kriya, whose power lies in practice. I myself consider Kriya the most effective device of salvation through self-effort ever to be evolved in man's search for the infinite. Kabbalah Ananda concluded with this earnest testimony. Through its use, the omnipotent God, hidden in all men, became visibly incarnated in the flesh of Lahiri Mahashaya and a number of his disciples. As Dharmini said, we are in the midst of a Lahiri Mahashaya celebration. And it's uh, interesting that his birthday and Mahasamadhi occur in the same week. And his birthday was yesterday, September 30th. And so it gives us a time to really focus on his life. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lahiri Mahashaya is here, pictured on the end. He is the disciple of Babaji, the guru of Yogananda's guru, Sri Yukteswar. 
And so with Yogananda as our father, we can think of Lahiri Mahashaya as our great-grandfather that way. I think the term in India is Upaguru, the Param Param Guru. But of course, when you have a distance in time and with generations that way, I don't know how close you were with your own great-grandfather. So similarly, we can have that experience with Lahiri Mahashaya. We can, we may not, but we can feel sometimes his remoteness or is it hard to tune into him or I know all about Babaji because of Rajani, but I am, and I learn all about Sri Yukteswarji because of Master's relationship with him. And Lahiri Mahashaya is just as present in the autobiography of a yogi, but still, sometimes uh, there can be some need to find a way to connect with him. Of course, you can take a pilgrimage to Benares and go to his home where he lived, and that is the that place is actually open on Guru Purnima each year. But other than that, it's closed. It's the family home. And we can also go to Babaji's cave. In fact, we are going next October, a, a year from now. And so uh, that's a wonderful place, too, to go and follow in Lahiri's footsteps. It's Babaji's cave, but it's also Lahiri's cave. It's really Lahiri and Babaji's cave. And so it was, it's nice to follow Lahiri's footsteps up into the mountains where he met Babaji for the first time outside Raniket. But still, even then, we are walking and following a path that he's tread 150 uh, three years ago or two years ago, a long time ago. And so he re it's very helpful to think of him as a living presence, even now, just as was read by Dharmini in Autobiography of a Yogi. The Kriya Ki will not lose its effectiveness when I am no longer in the body. Now, of course, you can imagine him telling his disciples that, I'm in the body with you right now. Don't worry. When I leave the body, Kriya will still be effective. And you can see them perhaps being reassured that way. But he's also speaking to us now, saying, I happen to no longer be in the body, but the Kriya Ki will work just as effectively for you also. So he's including us in this. Time and space don't exist for the masters. We can understand how space in some way doesn't even exist for us in the sense that you can have a video conference call with someone on the other side of the earth and see that if it's the sun is outside your window, that it's dark outside their window. First time I saw that, I thought, wow, it really is Dwapara Yuga. Because they'd always told me that when the sun is here, it's not over there, but I didn't know. I didn't have proof until you saw, hey, it's not there. It really is here. I guess the earth really is round. I've just experienced it. You know, it's different than people just say the earth is round. Yes, yes, the earth is round. Before they said the earth is flat. So we all said, yes, yes, the earth is flat. So it's different when you experience proof of it. But still, we come to, when, when it comes to Lahiri Mahashaya, we want to uh, also develop our devotion towards him. And it's easier to develop devotion towards someone when you get to know them. It's also easier to develop devotion towards someone or something if you feel gratitude. And we feel gratitude, as we practiced in the retreat yesterday, the most easily to something that has given us something. In other words, or, or give, feel gratitude towards a person who has given us a lot. If somebody has helped you or somebody has cared for you, if your parents, for example, have sheltered you and raised you well, don't you naturally feel gratitude towards them or a friend who has always been by your side? It's easy to feel gratitude in that way. Yes, we want to get to unconditional love, to divine love that loves no matter how people treat us. That is very much uh, something we need to strive for on the path. And yet, it's natural and easy to love something or someone who has helped us so much. So how has Lahiri Mahashaya helped us directly? There are, well, at least two things I can think of directly and sort of one other, but there's three things that come to mind uh, for me when thinking of Lahiri Mahashaya. If it's hard to place him in your mind, this may make it easier. The f when you think of Lahiri Mahashaya, just think two words. Kriya Yoga. That's, he was the first Kriya Yogi to walk 
on the earth among uh, everyone else. Babaji summoned him to that cave and initiated him, and he was the first Kriya Yogi initiate in the world, just one of them. And see how through all his disciples and their disciples' disciples and through all of Master's disciples that we're more familiar with and all of their disciples, how, how many Kriyabans are now populating the earth? I don't know the number. It must be above 10,000, maybe more. But how many are practicing Kriya just as before the yogis were practicing Kriya but only in the mountains? You couldn't get Kriya initiation any other way. You sort of, what's the password? Sushumna. Okay, then they let you in. But otherwise, there's no way to get Kriya Yoga among, uh, you know, just while living in the world. And so Babaji said, we want Kriya to be known again. Babaji, as it says in the autobiography, rediscovered the technique which is a nice way to say that Babaji brought the technique back out. It isn't as if someone, Babaji was walking one day and tripped over a box and found Kriya Yoga and said, Abhidhya, you know, <laughs> he knew all these things. They know all these things before, during, and after, but they also have to play a human role so we have something to relate to. So he initiated Lahiri Mahashaya and said, give Kriya to all who ask humbly for help. This was after Babaji had first said, give it only to sannyasis, only to those who will renounce everything. And Lahiri <coughs> Mahashaya said, what about everyone else? They may not even embark on the spiritual path if the Kriya key be withheld from them. And so Babaji said, the divine has spoken through you. And so this gift of Kriya to all is sort of two-sided though. On the one hand, thank God, Babaji and Lahiri Mahashaya came to save all of us from our misery through giving us a way to freedom. But on the other hand, they only did so in response to the prayers of people uh, on earth for such help. The masters respond to the kind of requests that they're given. Swamiji pointed out, God answers the prayers that are asked. He answers the questions that are asked. It has to first come from our recognition of our need and our desire for that kind of help. That's really the, the essence of discipleship. I want help. And so in the same way, they were, they were responding to the general call of people to say, I want to live in the world, but I also want to practice uh, a technique that will free me in this lifetime. Of course, it's not a guarantee, but let's either get freed in this lifetime or get as close as possible to getting free in this lifetime, as opposed to either go towards God in this lifetime or run in the opposite direction. Those aren't the two alternatives. So, why is it even that there were so many uh, householders who were, cr were crying out for a technique of yoga. It's really not that way. It was just that there are a bunch of yogis who were heading back to the Himalayas for one more incarnation, and Babaji said, no, you're going to Saitapet. <laughs> and so they were saying, no, 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 I meditate in caves. That's what we do. We're yogis. He said, no. The time has come, it's Dwapara Yuga on that planet over there, and so it's time to bring a balance between the, the living for God, the re inner renunciation, and outer worldly life. These two can be brought together now. This is the time for it. So, again, don't identify yourself as a householder who has a hobby of yoga, but rather as a Himalayan yogi who is also having to get an Aadhaar card and register <laughs> it with their mobile number and all these things. You see, and it's not just because there was some global mission that was needed and so recruits were sent. It's that we needed that balance in ourselves. After, you know, 25 um, incarnations in a cave or a monastery, it doesn't hurt to step outside and breathe the air and kind of mix with everyone else at uh, Big Bazaar and kind of, you know, get, to get the balance that can only come through social interaction or even interaction with society, even if it is to say, oh yes, that's right, um, back to the Himalayas, please. Sometimes we'll have that experience, but we're balancing things in our own nature that way. 
So, first thing Lahiri Mahashaya has given us is Kriya Yoga. The name Kriya Yoga was given the technique by Lahiri Mahashaya, not by Babaji. So even every time you say Kriya Yoga, you have Lahiri Mahashaya to thank for that name. In fact, it reminds me, uh, sometimes in India it can be confusing with so many techniques now called Kriya Yoga that which Kriya Yoga you're, are we even talking about? So if that ever comes up, uh, Swamiji, for example, would say uh, the, Lahiri, the Kriya Yoga of Lahiri Mahashaya. That's how he would put it. And, but once he was talking to Ananda Moi Ma, the woman saint, and he was asking her a question about Kriya, and he wanted to clarify, I mean the technique of Lahiri Mahashaya, but he said, I mean my Kriya. And she said, no, my Kriya. You know, it's, it's really God's Kriya. And it's a universal technique no matter what we do. And other techniques are similar to Kriya Yoga. I'm not specifically saying this is the highest and best. It is for me. And certainly Babaji said it was a, it's a great technique. But it's not for us to compare to other paths. Other paths try to accomplish it in different ways or even very similar ways. It even says in Autobiography of a Yogi that Jesus practiced a technique like, either practiced Kriya Yoga or a technique like it. And Swamiji said, Master meant very much like it, <laughs> you know, very, very similar. Because it works with the heart of the reactive process. It works with the karma that, that keeps us stuck and helps us to get rid of it and by working with it at the source of the problem. Now, Another thing that Lahiri Mahashaya gave us, as she mentioned in, in what she just read from Autobiography of a Yogi, was so many disciples, so many living proofs of the uh, effectiveness of Kriya Yogi, Kriya Yoga. Swam Swami Pranabhananda and Ram Gopal Muzumdar mentioned in the Autobiography of a Yogi. Master said, we're fully liberated beings. He, he mentioned these avatars as well were fully liberated. Fully liberated means not just jivan mukta, but beyond that to param mukta. What that means is the first stage of liberation, jivan mukta, when you are jivan mukta, you've gotten rid of the ego. And so you cannot create more karma. That makes you one with God. And that's really should be our goal in this lifetime. Master said so. Strive to become a jivan mukta in this lifetime. And yet, there is still that past karma to be cleared out. And when we clear all that karma out, then we become a paramukta. And when such a soul comes back to earth, they come as an avatar. And so, it isn't as if they're elbowing out the poor jivan mukta, saying, you know, no, I am your senior. It is not that way. When you're one with God, you're one with God. But a fully liberated master, a paramukta master said, can manifest more of God's power on this earth that way. That's, that's you could say, one difference. And so Lahiri Mahashaya, two of his disciples, had reached that stature. So it makes you think, as master said, when he met Swami, Swami Pranabhananda, who just offhandedly materialized a second body to go and summon someone from the market and bring him to the house, the master said, when Swami Pranabhananda was praising his guru, Lahiri Mahashaya, the master writes, if, his, if the disciple could summon an extra body when needed, what miracle would be barred from the guru? I mean, it's just amazing to contemplate. Ram Gopal Muzumdar meditated, I think it was 16 hours a day in a cave. And not content with that, he found uh, for 16 hours a day for like 18 years or something. Then he found an even more remote cave, was meditating 20 hours a day. And for years, when Master met him, or maybe Master met him at a different place, but that's what he had done. And Master was saying, what? If, if that's what you're doing and you're not sure of God's favor, what can mortals like us even hope for? But Ram Gopal said, it's, how can I think that by 40 years of meditation I could capture the infinite? You know, that's nothing really. And meanwhile, he was fully liberated. So it, he had already captured the infinite, you could say, or the infinite had finally captured him. And so... The many other disciples, Swami Kebalananda, who was the one speaking, a master Sanskrit tutor, was a great, great soul, a Jivan Mukta as well, Master said. And 
also Swami Keshavananda, who is mentioned in there and actually has a retreat, uh, his uh, ashram in um, outside of Rishikesh in Haridwar, which some of us have visited. Actually, there's a small urn there with some of Lahiri Mahashaya's ashes of his body. And so uh, there are many disciples of Lahiri Mahashaya who began spreading the vibration of Kriya Yoga all around India. And whether we come in direct contact with them or their lineage or not, that presence of Kriya, not just located only in Banaras where Lahiri Mahashaya was practicing it, but throughout, is a great blessing and started this wave. It was the first, you could say, the first, the first seeds of a wave, to mix a meta metaphor, forget it. The first ripples of that wave the, of Kriya that would began spreading throughout the whole world. That, those, that vibration is also held strongly uh, by when you have saints in the world practicing Kriya Yoga. That's something we, in our own small way, are also trying to contribute to. The more just you can serve society by practicing Kriya and sending out waves of harmony, not from yourself, but allowing God to flow through you. It was a wonderful uh, story of Lahiri Mahashaya when it was Swami Kebalananda, this same Sanskrit tutor of masters, who said he felt pity on one of Lahiri Mahashaya's disciples, Ramu, who was blind from birth. And he said, why should you be blind when you have such a great master who can heal you? Go ask him for healing. And so Ramu approached Lahiri Mahashaya and said, sir, would it be possible for you to heal me? Help me to see. And Lahiri Mahashaya said, someone has connived to put me in a difficult spot. I have no healing power. And remember, not only was he an avatar and fully liberated, but had disciples who were fully liberated. He's saying, I have no healing power. That makes you think a bit when we meet people walking around or the thought comes into ourselves, I do have healing power. <laughs> check your resume, check Lahiri Mahashai's resume, <laughs> and then maybe think again. <laughs> and so he said, I have no healing power. And then Ramu said, the infinite one within you can certainly heal me. And then Lahiri Mahashaya said, that is a different uh, story. The, the infinite uh, power is unlimited and can certainly, he said, the God that illuminates the stars and galaxies can certainly bring light into your eyes. And he gave him a certain remedy to practice. I think it was for seven days. And on the eighth day, Ramu opened his eyes and could see again. It's amazing. Now, the... Other thing to remember that Lahiri Mahashai gave us, the third thing, first Kriya Yoga, then the Kriya Yogis, the saints, the disciples of his that spread this vibration throughout India and which led to throughout the world, is his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. This is one that you will probably come to know through Yoganandaji's commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the, uh, Swamiji wrote it as the essence of the Bhagavad Gita as explained by Paramahansa Yogananda. It's based on what Yogananda learned. Again, these avatars play the role of learning, and so we'll just use that language for now, even though it's a little bit of wink-wink. But he learned from Sri Yukteswarji, who learned it from Lahiri Mahashaya. But Lah Lahiri Mahashaya was the first to put out the interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita as an allegory, where the characters are symbolic. Ma Lahiri Mahashaya said, Byasa used a historical event, which did happen, to weave a spiritual teaching throughout it where the, the main characters were historical, but many of the other characters were not. They were created to be a part of the story. Be and he said they represent qualities within ourselves. Even Krishna says in the Gita that the very um, field, the very Kurukshetra or Dharmakshetra, the, war the battlefield, is the body itself. This is where the battle is taking place, within us. We have Pandavas. And we have core of us. And I don't think I need to explain the image further because we know that constantly. We've got Arjuna on one side saying this, and we've got Duryodhana on the other side saying this, and we're trying to decide who to see first. And so with this then, 
is even though we, as I said, it was it's Master's book that so fully, clearly explains it in such detail and with such deep perceptions that that was that that interpretation was first put out by Lahiri Mahashai. And so this is a continuation, really, of his work with Kriya and the Gita. In fact, Master, when he said uh, about, when he spoke about his mission, said, I came for two things. And of course, there were 2,000 other things also. But in this case, he said, I came for two things. For the interpretation of the scriptures, the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita, and for bringing Kriya Yoga. And these were two things initiated by Lahiri Mahashaya. So Master was just acting as an emissary of these masters. They're all one. So it isn't as if, you know, there's the boss and then the sub-boss and then the sub-sub-boss and all that. It isn't how they operate at all. In fact, Master made an interesting statement that Lahiri Mahashaya was his astral guru and Sri Yukteswar was his physical guru and Babaji was his, ca was his causal guru. Don't ask me to explain. I can barely even say it. I can't much less explain it. But, so, there's more going on here than they're even telling us. But they need to assume roles and act in a way that we can relate to, that we can understand. Now, on the other hand, it's very helpful to think of Lahiri Mahashaya as the householder yogi, the householder saint, that he worked as a government accountant, then he met Babaji in the, in the Himalayas, and then he worked for another, I forget, 25 or 28 years as a government accountant with GST, with VAT, with everything, and then certainly TDS, and then he uh, retired finally on a pension. And we can think, my gosh, if he could have met Babaji and then also be working on accounts, and they didn't even have Excel back then, <laughs> that, you know, we can certainly deal with whatever burdens we have to put up with. And he showed us that the life of a householder and a yogi are not separate at all and so on. Now, it, the objection has sometimes been raised that, yes, Lahiri Mahashai was a householder, but he was also 24 hours in Samadhi. And so he wasn't necessarily prone to the same fears and sufferings that we all deal with because he was in Nirvikalpa Samadhi and beyond. I mean, his wife uh, actually um, woke up one night to see him levitating in the middle of the room, which, you know, is not common for many householders, <laughs> and surrounded by angels. I mean, I don't know the last time an angel was in your bedroom, but if so, I mean, I can imagine that you, we would be bowing at the feet of this great being of light. Instead, the angels were all bowing at Lahiri Mahashaya. And so she woke up and she thought she was dreaming, and he said, you are not dreaming. And she just said, Guruji, Master, forgive me for not knowing your stature, and I want to be your disciple and be trained by you. And so he initiated her into Kriya Yoga, and she said that I regret not having Kriya Yoga earlier. Because, of course, she saw this whole time that he was teaching Kriya Yoga, and she herself wasn't interested until then. And then she felt, which is quite natural to all of us, remember, this is 148 years ago, and yet she had that feeling, I wish I had Kriya sooner. Have you had that feeling before? Especially if you don't have Kriya yet, <laughs> I wish I had it sooner, like now. It'll come. But she expressed that very natural thought of the devotee. And Lahiri Mahashaya said, the time was not yet ripe. I have silently been working out your karma, and now you are ready and willing to receive the initiation. So remember that teaching too, that the masters, before we come to the path in this life, they are silently working out our karma. They're watching us. Babaji told Lahiri Mahashaya directly, I have been watching you for 33 years since you were a child, when you, he told him different stories of his life. I was there the whole time until we could meet. And so, don't you think Master is watching you if he's omnipotent and omnipresent? Omniscient was the word, one of the omni-somethings. If he's all-knowing, does he have a little corner of his consciousness reserved for you that he can keep an eye on you? Remember, Master said to Swamiji, I know every thought you think. 
And he demonstrated that not just for Swamiji, but for so many of the disciples. So the masters are watching us, helping us to become ready to resume the spiritual path. And I say resume because we have very likely been on the path before and are picking up where we left off. But here he specifically told his wife, the time was not yet ripe. I was silently helping you work out karma. And then another story that's very easy to relate to. Though she understood, I mean, she saw him levitating in the room with the angels worshiping him. And yet later on, is seized by a fit of something or other. She said, you give all your time and energy to the disciples. And it is a shame that you don't devote more energy to providing money for your wife and children. And so, seized by that uh, materialistic uh, concern, you can understand it. You see, we can either say, ha, oh, how ridiculous, but can we say that that, is, that thought has never occurred to us? That though we understand the divinity of our souls, that though we know the masters come to save us, though we know the only point of this life is to find God, don't, don't we also kind of say, yes, but I have this fear and only money will solve it? And God, it's fine, can I have life, freedom in this life and some rupees too? <laughs> and so, uh, what happens then? How does Lahiri Mahashaya, you know, the everyday householder, the everyman, solve this dilemma? How does he, as an Am Admi, forgive me, but if you <laughs> understand that <laughs> phrase, how does he take care of this? Because he's a householder, of course. And so, met with this understandable request, what does he do? He disappears. <laughs> And then the voice, he, the voice comes from the whole room saying, don't you see it's all nothing? How could a nothing like me produce riches? And Jesus, forgive me, Guruji, forgive me. My sinful eyes can no longer see you. Please reappear. And so he reappears on the ceiling. <laughs> With his head touching the ceiling of the room. And slowly he descends back to the floor. And then he says, seek the inner wealth. And as you gain in the inner wealth, you will find the outer wealth always uh, available, put in much better words than, than I have just said. And then he also added, one of my disciples will provide for you. And so it became that way. But you see, how we have to acknowledge that in our lives, especially if we're following the path, if we're sincere, God does provide for us. Often our crises are fears of what might happen, but actually hasn't happened. Or our wish that, yes, he provides, but it would be nice if he provided more. As one friend of ours said, Divine Mother handles finances this way. She does give, but not a rupee extra and not a moment sooner. And so sometimes it comes in just at the last minute, but we see that it works out. And so give your life to God and allow him to flow his grace through you to protect you. So with this objection to, yes, it's easy to follow Lahiri Mahashaya's footsteps in a way, but not so easy. I mean, I need a ladder to get up to the ceiling and so on, and I wouldn't dare try to float down. So what, what can we do with all this? The one thing to remember, because we can sometimes over-exaggerate this sense of being householders versus renunciates. At Ananda village long ago, uh, sometimes the monks and the householders would have diff would play different games together or sports together and so on. And so in one situation, the monks needed an extra person, so they were asking uh, one of the householders to come to their side. And he said, I am a householder. And Swamiji said, we shouldn't really be identifying ourselves as anything, as monks or householders. That's just an outer karma. That's just an outer role. We should identify ourselves as devotees. The, role, the goal in this life is not to become a householder or a renunciate, but, but it is to find God. And in order to find God, we all have to be renunciates. To find God, we're saying, I choose God over this world. Why? because I am pure, Why? because I reject the foul temptations of this earth? No, because I have discovered that nothing else works. That's it. That's the only reason. It's very practical, it's very efficient, it's optimized, even McKinsey and company would approve. <laughs> Go with that which works. And the only thing that works is God. It's the only thing. 
And so um, there is a joke about that. It's, it's an okay joke, but since I brought it up, I have to tell it. So it was, so this, the story goes, it was, it's told in, in the West in a Christian context that Moses and Jesus are playing golf together uh, with a little boy. And so, you know, they're, they're all working on their game and very, you know, kind of uh, studious this way. And then when it's the little boy's turn to uh, uh, hit the ball, because Moses gets onto the green and Jesus gets even his ball closer. And then when the little boy hits the ball, it goes sideways. But then it bounces off a tree and then from the tree it hits a um, uh, wall, bouncing off the wall. Uh, it... it lands on the ground far away, but then the squirrel picks it up and runs with it towards the tee and drops it in the hole. And Moses turns to Jesus and says, I hate it when we play with your dad. <laughs> and it's a silly joke, but the, the point is also a deeper one, that we try so hard to get everything right, not that I'm saying anything against Moses or Jesus here, but then God just comes and in the impossible way works everything out completely. And so we, we're so proud of what we're trying to do. And meanwhile, if we just give him a chance, the chipmunk will carry you, or the squirrel will carry you all the way home. You don't have to do anything. There's a better metaphor than that, I'm sure. <laughs> it's just sort of, but anyway, never mind. So keep this in mind. Lahiri Mahashaya brought us Kriya. He brought us this interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita. He proved that Kriya worked through all of his saintly disciples whose vibrations are still felt. As I said, Kable Ananda, you can visit his ashram in, in uh, outside Haridwar. Also, he had another disciple, um, Shanyal Mahashaya, who had an ashram in Puri. And so when we go to Puri on pilgrimage to visit Sri Yukteswar Samadhi, just around the corner is Shanyal Mahashaya's uh, place as well. And let's not forget that Lahiri Mahashaya gave us Sri Yukteswarji himself, and even Master. Remember, Autobiography of a Yogi was commissioned by who? Lahiri Mahashaya. He didn't tell Master because Master was a little young at the time. They, you know, they were only a few years on earth at the same time. But when Lahiri Mahashaya's disciples wanted to write books about him and create an organization and spread the word of Kriya Yoga, he said no. And he, as Master said, he prohibited all his disciples to write any life about him, but he predicted that someone will come to spread this message everywhere. And Master even writes in autobiography that even though Babaji and Lahiri Mahashaya have counseled secrecy around miracles and these deeper teachings, he said, if I have appeared to disregard their advice, it is only because I have felt their inner blessing. And he said, there are many other stories and teachings that I am not giving in the book. And we're all waiting for Autobiography of a Yogi Part 2. And it exists, but you have to go to Hiranyaloka to get a copy. And so <laughs> we have to just, all we have to do is work, keep practicing Kriya, just keep working away on that, on those things, and we'll get free. And it's the only joy there is, really. It doesn't make us not interact with the world. In fact, it makes it easier to interact with the world, easier to take care of others as well. In fact, remember, just as Lahiri Mahashaya was silently helping his wife to work out her karma, we have people in our lives who we care for, but who are not open to the spiritual path or are not uh, ready to work on different things that need healing. And so rather than remind them again for the thousandth time what they ought to be doing differently, see how effective that is if it hasn't worked 999 times, rather than that, try just praying for them. I wouldn't say try to silently work out their karma because that's best done once we've worked out our own karma. That happened to me once. I was sick and injured and I said, gosh, am I helping to work, someone, work out someone's karma? And I sort of heard in my mind, yes, your own. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Ridiculous sometimes the thoughts that can occur to us. So we are, but you can pray for them and those prayers matter. You can pray that the masters bless them. That influence will have greater help than much of the material help you can provide to them. Do your duty, but more than that, pray to give them that blessing, which is the only thing lasting 
in this world, the only thing they can take with them after they leave. And meanwhile, let us all work so that when we leave, the masters will usher us into freedom and say, welcome. God bless you.